I'm a professor in forestry and natural resources, um, and I'm a member of the College of Agriculture's Diversity Action Team in Agriculture. And um, on behalf of the College of Agriculture's Office of Multicultural Programs and uh, the College of Health and Human Sciences and, and the Diversity Action Team in Agriculture, um, I welcome you to another event in our annual uh, week-long Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. This is a panel on climate justice, um, sort of informal title is addressing climate justice in, mid in the Midwest and beyond. We'll have perspectives from, um, from the Midwest and, and really all over the world on, on climate justice today from a panel of people who um, have current or former affiliations with Purdue. Um, so today's panel will be moderated by uh, Dr. Brady Hardiman, and um, he's an assistant professor in our Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. He's a terrestrial ecologist and biogeochemist interested in how the natural world responds to the variety of things that people do to it, uh, whether that's through management or some kind of disturbance or conversion of natural areas to cities. And in his work, he uses field observations and big outdoor experiments and remote sensing and models to, to study how ecosystems and their processes change as they become progressively more urbanized. Um, and um, that urban setting will be sort of a part of a focus of our, our climate panel today and climate justice panel today and thinking about um, how climate change can, um, can disproportionately uh, disadvantage people in, in some aspects of urban settings uh, while uh, not having as big an effect on others. But anyway, um, I'm going to leave that topic mainly to, to Brady and to the panelists. I'm going to get the introductions of the panelists out of the way right now so that we can um, just go straight into the discussion today. The format will be to, to have a little bit of an overview on the topic from, from Brady, and then, uh, and then we'll have some brief presentations from each of the panelists, and then we'll have some time for discussion afterwards. We expect that the presentations are probably going to take most of the, uh, the hour. Um, we'll have some time for questions at the end, and, and then we are able to stick around uh, as late as 1.30 to answer questions for anybody who wants to linger and, and keep the conversation going. Um, but we do expect to pretty much wrap things up in the formal way um, within this first hour. So the, the panelists that we have today with us are, um, they all have former or current uh, or both Purdue affiliations. Um, so up first is Dr. Becca Nixon. She's a postdoctoral researcher currently with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, um, which is based here at Purdue. And she's also in the Human Dimensions Lab in the Forestry and Natural Resources Department here at Purdue. She got a PhD from Purdue uh, in natural resource social science. And um, she has dual master's degrees in sustainable agriculture and community and regional planning from Iowa State University. Her work focuses on adaptation to social ecological change, environmental justice, and natural resource management through research projects she's done here in the Midwest, but also um, far abroad, so in, in Kyrgyzstan and Pakistan as well. Um, second up, we have Dr. Ben Rachinok. He's a postdoctoral researcher in Stanford University's Department of Civil and Engineering civil and environmental engineering, uh, but he got a PhD in industrial engineering from Purdue, uh, working under the supervision of Professor Roshi Nategi in the Laboratory for Advancing Sustainable Critical Infrastructure. And his work focuses on integrating environmental justice and engineering principles to create climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies that justly benefit all populations. And currently he's working to develop tools and management policies to enable low cost water supply planning that's resilient to droughts and enables people access to have access to affordable water across all communities. And then third up is Savannah Schultz, who is a uh, almost Dr. Savannah Schultz. She's, she's a PhD candidate in anthropology at Purdue. Um, she's an environmental anthropologist with a background in primatology, giving her a unique perspective on issues related to human wildlife conflict, conservation, and the overall well-being and multiple livelihoods of local people in conservation zones. And she recently defended her dissertation called Displacement in Place, an ethnographic analysis of indigenous Batwa people's lived experience with conservation and development. Um, 
Also, while she's been at Purdue, she was a member of the Presence Influence Project, which examined indigenous representation in global environmental governance at the 2016 World Conservation Congress in uh, Hawaii. And uh, so she brings a really international perspective to this uh, conversation on climate justice. So without uh, further introduction, that's all of it. Over to Brady Hardiman to uh, introduce this and, and moderate the panel. All right, hopefully you guys are seeing my slides now and hearing me. All right, so um, thanks Jeff for that great introduction and for, for helping or for leading the organization of this whole thing. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna start out by with a caveat that uh, I consider myself still very much a learner in this area. It's not um, something I have any formal training on, but it's something that uh, has become an increasingly important part of both my teaching and my research. Um, I teach urban ecology in the fall and I teach uh, intro to GIS in the spring and in both classes um, as I'm updating materials. Uh, the, the current events are really putting a, an exclamation point on uh, the importance of environmental and climate justice. And so I'm going to try and kick us off here with a little bit of a primer so that maybe we're all on the same page. I'll share what I know. Um, and then I'm looking very, for, very much forward to learning from our panelists, uh, just like everyone else. Okay, um, so I figured I'd start out with some definitions. There are a variety of definitions for both environmental justice and climate justice. Um, this is a quote from Robert Bullard, who many consider the father of environmental justice. Um, and he said that environmental justice embraces the principle that all people and communities have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations, right? Um, so that is the environmental justice, not the context we're living in now. And I would add on top of that, that environmental justice recognizes that access to the benefits of nature uh, is not equitably distributed. So we know that the benefits of nature are heterogeneously distributed across the landscape, just like natural processes and ecosystems. Um, but who has access to those benefits is very heterogeneous and often correlates strongly with uh, race and income. Um, climate justice, on the other hand, insists on a shift from a discourse about greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into more of a civil rights movement with people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its heart. This is a quote from Mary Robinson, who was president of Ireland and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and I would say here that climate justice recognizes that the impacts of climate change are not equitably distributed. Some people are going to feel those impacts more than others. Again, that often correlates with race and income. All right. And so a couple of examples, some case studies that are near and dear to my heart. Um, in urban areas in particular, uh, one of my areas of scholarship, go back to almost 100 years ago now, where um, the federal government in the US started a program to increase home ownership and to ensure that people could afford to stay in their homes during the Great Depression, when obviously there was a lot of economic struggle. Um, and so they were offering low interest mortgages, federal loans, but the access to those loans and the interest rates that were available to people depended a lot on where the house was located within the community and different neighborhoods were categorized uh, into sort of durable through undesirable categories. And you can see that old map here of Richmond, Virginia, green and blue are considered desirable and those would be uh, homes there would be qualified for the most, or sorry, the lowest interest rates, most affordable mortgages and then red and yellow would have either higher interest rates or they might not be uh, might not have access to those federally backed uh, low interest loans. So if we fast forward to today and we look at those same neighborhoods, um, but on the contemporary landscape, we can see that those uh, neighborhoods that were classified as either green or blue A and B categories have more trees than neighborhoods which were uh, previously redlined or classified as the red and yellow neighborhoods as undesirable, um, and that the these undesirable redlined neighborhoods have more pavement. All right, 
Um, and so that's an interesting observation, right? But it has real impacts on people's lived experiences in these communities uh, in the everyday experience. And so in the city of Richmond, uh, and in fact, with a great number of cities, especially throughout the US, uh, but around the world as well, we see really strong correlations between the amount of impervious surface area or pavement um, and air temperature. And so neighborhoods that have a lot of pavement and not a lot of tree canopy to provide shade can be 12 degrees hotter than uh, a shady neighborhood, right? And so this is uh, a persistent environmental legacy of previously racist practices. Um, and so this really highlights for us that the, the present doesn't replace the landscape of history, it only paints a new layer on top of it. So we're still very much living in communities that have very physical, tangible, uh, identifiable um, fingerprints of history on them, right? And so this uh, figure is coming from an analysis that was done of uh, 37 US cities that were historically redlined. And so you can see this different cities shown in different panels here. On the y-axis, the vertical axis is showing tree canopy cover. Um, and then you see each of the four red line categories. The green category would be considered most desirable. The red category is considered least desirable. Again, that correlates with racial composition. Higher percentages of non-white residents correlate with, correlated with uh, less desirable communities according to this redlining schema. And what you see consistently across all of these cities is that uh, those formerly redlined communities have less can in these all across the country. Indianapolis is shown here, uh, just for a little bit of context in our backyard. Um, and uh, I always get the question of, was this a, an unintended consequence of an otherwise well-meaning federal program? Um, and this is a, a snapshot of one of the four program who was you can see that it is explicitly racist. They are, um, by design, classifying neighborhoods with higher fractions of black and brown residents as being less desirable because of those residents, okay? Um, so it, the program was explicitly and deliberately racist. Uh, and it still has impacts on the landscape today that those communities are experiencing. And so this is a, a figure from an NPR article came out in the last year or two, um, showing the difference between average city temperature and average neighborhood temperature in these formerly redlined areas. Um, the circles here are illustrating Portland, Oregon, which has one of the highest differences between um, A-class neighborhoods, these desirable neighborhoods, uh, and D-class neighborhoods, the redlined neighborhoods. Um, it's a difference of as much as 12 degrees. And so um, that has a pretty profound impact on people's lived experiences in these areas. Um, and it's not just the correlation with race, it's a correlation with income as well. And so this is from another NPR article um, where you could put in a city of your in Indianapolis and you can see there's um, moderate correlation here between the heat within the city uh, and the income of the residents within And what this means is that the status quo is for those legacies of environmental injustice to continue. And sustain going forward. Um, work in terms of canopy cover in cities and urban heat island effects, but this is true of flooding risk, of asthma risk. Make about where we route our state highways when they when we make those. Um, whose kids will get asthma, basically, um, and that really has. the costs of our choices uh, for 
decades and generations afterwards. Um, right, so I'll keep moving for the sake of time here. Um, and so transitioning a little bit from environmental justice to climate justice, uh, I said earlier that historical leg legacies shape our landscapes. They shape our contemporary landscapes, but they also shape our future landscapes. Um, and we know that climate change is painting a new layer of injustice on top of the legacies of environmental injustice that already blanket our landscapes, particularly in urban areas. But climate change is going to do that globally and well outside of urban areas as well. And so you can see on the top figure here the share of global cumulative CO2 emissions in the year 2020. So this is who's contributing the most CO2 to the atmosphere. And then on the bottom graph, you see a figure from the uh, UK Met Office uh, looking at climate risks in different portions of the globe. Um, and this is not just elevated temperature, but it's risk of drought, risk of extreme precipitation events, flood risk, storm risk, um, et cetera. And so you can see that the, the portions of the planet that have contributed least to emitting the CO2 and greenhouse gases that have caused climate change um, are likely to experience the most severe impacts. Uh, on top of that, all of the factors that make a community susceptible to environmental injustice actually increase its risk of experiencing the most severe impacts of climate change. Um, and so this all sounds really grim, and, and hopefully this is the, the worst 10 minutes of your day, and you go on and have a wonderful day. Um, but to hopefully transition out of the, the doom and gloom here, I'm, I'm actually hopeful about it because I think we're seeing more recognition of these problems than we have at any previous point in history. Um, there's broad consensus that these things exist, that they are bad, that we can and should do something about them. And so I'm really excited to hear from our panelists today um, who represent uh, sort of the forefront of that pattern um, in trying to identify the causes of and hopefully solutions to many of the challenges that I have presented here. And so with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Becca, um, who will talk about some of her research. Thanks so much, Brady and Jeff. I'm just gonna share my screen, hopefully, successfully. But maybe unsuccessfully. Um. actually not allowing me. Try it again. I think it's switched so that you can share now. Um. Jeff, I see you talking, but I don't hear you. Were you able to get it, Becca? I can't actually. Jeff, I did send you my slide, so I'm wondering if you would be willing to share it, or I can go second if someone else is able to. Yeah, because I have it checked as multiple participants can share simultaneously. Um, what if I do it one participant can share at a time? See what that does. Oh, okay. I think it is allowing me now. Yep, you're good to go. Okay. Um, sorry for that delay, everyone. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Okay, so. Thank you, Brady and Jeff, for that introduction um, and to all the organizers for facilitating this event. Um, I am really grateful for this space to have these conversations here at Purdue. Brady, I'll try and answer that call for a little bit of hope here in this presentation. Um, but I really think that even having this conversation is an indicator of hope um, that we are all coming together for this. So as Jeff said, my name is Becca Nixon and I'm a postdoc with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant in the Department of FNR here at Purdue. 
And today I'm going to talk about two different projects, one based on the east coast of the US and one a little bit closer to home here um, near the Great Lakes. And specifically, I'm gonna be talking about how changes in the environment, um, be it from climate change or environmental projects, um, how to drive community change and the equity implications of those changes, especially in the form of gentrification and displacement. So many of us are familiar with the process of gentrification. This is what the US Department of Housing and Urban Development defines as a form of neighborhood change that occurs when high income groups move to low income areas. Um, potentially altering the cultural and financial landscape of the original neighborhood. Recently, there has been increasing research as well as media attention on the role of climate change as a driver of gentrification. And this work has largely focused on coastal areas where sea level rise increases risk to low-lying areas. This makes the higher ground less vulnerable and more desirable, potentially driving up housing costs in those areas. So Keenan and his colleagues were one of the first to study this process, and um, they looked at the case study of Miami-Dade County in Florida. They categorized climate gentrification into three specific processes. So first, they found superior investment is a process where high-income households, like we mentioned, move away from the vulnerable shoreline that was previously really attractive um, in order to avoid the risk of flooding and sea level rise. Second, climate gentrification can happen through resi um, resilience investment when infrastructure or other measures are taken to protect homes from, from climate risks, and that subsequently drives up those prices of the homes that are protected. Third, in some cases, they found that low-income households are displaced um, from higher risk areas when they cannot afford the cost burden of living in those areas. So they found that sometimes high income households actually stayed in the riskier environments, took on those extra costs um, while the low income houses left. But in all cases, right, we see these lower income, more vulnerable households um, leaving those protected areas. Based on this work, I've been collaborating with a team of interdisciplinary researchers, researchers um, supported by the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center to assess the patterns of climate gentrification on the east coast of the US, where high density urban centers are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We use machine learning to assess social economic data, housing indicators, and environmental factors from 51 counties on the east coast um, to look at the changes over time to assess how these communities are vulnerable to climate gentrification. Specifically, we looked at indicators of social economic status like poverty and education level, race and ethnicity data, property values, rent, in addition to environmental data like coastal erosion and flood and weather related damages. So together, these give us a picture of vulnerability and community change. For example, we can see if housing prices are going up, is there racial or ethnic demographic changes that might indicate um, vulnerable groups being pushed out of certain areas and together can help us understand the process of climate gentrification. And what emerged from our analysis was four overall clusters of these counties in terms of their vulnerability and changes. First, we have these ye yellow counties and these are characterized by low environmental damages, increasing property values, decreasing in housing availability, and the population becoming whiter and wealthier. So we see some indicators, right, that are um, often used in terms of measuring gentrification in terms of increasing income, increasing, um, decreasing diversity, and increasing property values. Second, we see this red cluster that indicates places with high environmental damages, increasing social vulnerability in terms of income and education levels, and declines in property values. And the third cluster appears to be some form of affordable development where there's actually a steady social economic composition, so not much change in income or racial or ethnic diversity, decreasing in housing vulnerability, and an increasing population. And the fourth cluster we see is increasing in vulnerability in housing prices, but declines, but are declining in population. Um, so perhaps this is areas that have yet to see an influx of new residents, or there are other factors that we have yet to consider. Overall, our results do suggest these four distinct patterns of combined housing, social, and climate vulnerability. And you can see that they are actually fairly geographically clustered into specific patterns um, with 
you see the blue cluster at the top there going into the yellow, green, and red um, being the potentially most vulnerable to climate gentrification. But further work is needed to assess how these processes manifest themselves at a smaller scale, specifically at a neighborhood scale. Um, but understanding these changes does allow targeted interventions that mitigate compounding vulnerabilities and foster climate justice, just like Brady was mentioning. So when we know these places are specifically vulnerable to not only climate change, but maybe they have high racial um, and income variability, we can protect our most vulnerable residents when we know that um, these are patterns of um, vulnerability to these risks. I want to bring this a little bit closer to home to briefly talk about a project I'm working on focused on three communities on Lake Michigan, where we see a somewhat similar process of environmental shifts driving community change and the equity implications of those change based on who is um, pushed out of low risk areas and who benefits from nature like Brady was talking about. But this time, instead of climate change driving these processes, and though it might play a role that I'm interested in looking at in the future, this time it's driven mostly by environmental cleanup projects. And these are in what we we'll call areas of concern, which were areas designated as highly degraded by the EPA, and mostly due to legacy pollutants from the high density of industry in these areas. And since their designation in the 1980s, there has been a huge effort in terms of remediation and restoration. Um, and we're interested in the social and cultural implications of the environmental cleanup in these areas, specifically looking at White Lake, Muskegon Lake, and the Grand Calumet River. So we interviewed leaders, analyzed secondary data and documents to better understand this process. And while there are definitely important benefits to the cleanup um, that we're seeing in these communities, we also are seeing similar equity implications that we saw along the East Coast in terms of community change and displacement. Just as a brief overview, you can see um, the amount of money that we've been investing in these areas. And you can also see um, diversity in terms of the median income, poverty rates, and the racial and um, ethnic differences in these areas, some in some more than others. But these are points to consider when you're thinking about the implications of the projects and who benefits from environmental cleanup and who's at risk of um, environmental pollutants. So we're interested in what happens when you pour this amount of money and resources in these areas, who benefits? Um, what about these historically excluded groups? How are they being impacted? And based on our interview data, we are seeing um, acknowledgement of these equity implications, um, as well as some of the demographic changes that are indicative of gentrification. For example, one watershed leader said that we have a legacy of environmental problems um, but you look at this younger generation that is moving in and populating the city. We have running groups, biking groups, we've got cranes going up for new condos and new apartments. Um, so you can see it, as I said, these indicators that can um, show that gentrification might be occurring as the demographic changes and the culture around these areas change. Another called out the repercussions of these changes stating that now you can see these mansions and the lakes are inundated with people. You've made the lake more appealing and people that have deep pockets are the only ones that can afford to benefit from it. So together, both these projects on the Great Lakes as well as the East Coast of the US show the complex social and environmental factors that are driving community change um, that can displace residents and worsen, worsen existing inequalities for low-income folks, um, historically excluded groups, and those who historically haven't been able to benefit from, um, from nature and the environment around them. And we see the ways that climate change um, can actually worsen those processes. And in terms of the hope that Brady was talking about, I think acknowledging these repercussions of the projects does point to the need for environmental projects, whether it be remediation, restoration, whether it's in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation projects, um, needing to consider how these processes have inequitable outcomes um, in order to then um, address those issues. There's been a lot of work in terms of affordable housing mandates and um, adaptation and mitigation infrastructure being more equitably, equitably distributed. And I hope that this work and the work of the other panelists and those attending um, can really support more equitable policies and adaptation moving forward. So thank you all for being here. I do wanna thank my funders and supporters, both the EPA um, and SysInc who've been able to support this work.
Thanks, Becca. That was great. Um, so in the interest of time, and so all the panelists have a, a shot to present, I think we'll hold the questions and go right ahead to our next panelist, who's Ben uh, Ratchinok. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Two years of Zoom, and I hope that I have learned a thing or two about how to do this. All right. Can you all see this if I do my screen in full screen like this? That's great. Excellent. Can you all hear me okay as well? Yes. Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Brady, for the introductions. And, and Becca, I think your talk really tees up a lot of this very nicely. I'll, I'll put the same caveat at the beginning, uh, that questions of environmental justice, question, questions of uh, climate justice are, are things that I am growing into my understanding and my learning of. And we see that uh, through the process of this work. As we interfaced and did a lot of this work with participation from community members, we learned a lot about what environmental justice meant and some of the issues facing these communities. And it has informed my understanding of environmental justice just in the last year or so. Um, so I'll give a little bit of an introduction to this work and sort of what this, um, what I'm gonna talk about today. This is a picture of uh, right there in the very center is, is California's governor, Gavin Newsom. He is standing in a, a very dry reservoir talking about water shortage issues in California. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about some of these issues in California and how particularly water shortages of impact high and low income individuals and how the decisions that water utilities make also impact high and low income individuals. So the, um, the idea is that I, I aim to study how engineering decision making and the decisions that, that engineered systems make, that the built environment that we make to manage the built environment to make it resilient how do those impact high income and low income or advantaged and disadvantaged groups? Um, so this is a pretty striking picture. Usually there's a, as you can see in the background of this, uh, or the, towards the top of this figure, there's a, a gray line, which indicates the sort of typical reservoir level for this. And it's, it's bone dry. Um, and California is certainly a very water stressed area of the country. So this is a very close to home issue for a lot of California residents. Um, but there continue to be a, a significant number of issues with respect to, to access to clean and affordable drinking water in California. Um, in 2014, the California legislature passed a law to say that every resident or every citizen has the right to clean, safe, affordable drinking water adequate for human consumption. Um, and this, there's no penalties if you aren't given this, but it is a, an official uh, legal mandate that every human being in California has this right and this has sparked a lot of, of interest. This has sparked a lot of interest in trying to make sure that this human right to water is being upheld. And so this is all occurring. And at the same time, these uh, types of news headlines pop up faster than I can add them to my slide deck that uh, the present estimate is that over a million people in California, so this is two to 5% of the population, does not have access to clean, safe, affordable drinking water. So a million people are either paying too much or they don't have clean water or they don't have access to drinking water. Um, and so, so this is a question that we're interested in asking. Um, and how, number one, how do, how do droughts and the sort of present hazards which impact California contribute to these issues of affordability? Uh, but also how do the engineering decisions that we make, how does our process of engineering contribute to potentially uh, unjust outcomes for high and low income or advantaged and disadvantaged groups? Um, so, so we think a lot about what I'm, what I'm thinking about in, in a lot of this work is, is something like water affordability. And I'll, I'll keep sort of putting some um, some numbers or some context around this. Uh, when I talk about water affordability, something that we think about is essentially how much of your income are you spending on water? Um, that's a really nice way to measure how affordable water is. So I take your average monthly water bill, I divide it by your average monthly income, and I can see that maybe you spend 5% of your income on water. Maybe you spend 15% of your income on water. I mean, a recent study looked at these, these numbers or these ratios uh, nationwide and found that in 2018 they did a study and there was about uh, people spent about 11% of their income on combined water and sewer bills. And they did the same study two years later and found that that was almost 12 and a half percent. So these water rates are tracked to be rising faster than inflation. This is particularly happening in water stressed regions like California, where we don't have a lot of available water and a lot of available sources have already been exhausted. Um, but if you dig a little bit deeper into this, these numbers, these are averages, uh, but they're significantly balanced uh, against being in favor of, of low income populations or, or historically disadvantaged groups. It is for most households making a median amount of income, water is relatively affordable and it is the lower tail, it is lower income folks who are experiencing the brunt of these affordability problems. 
So the couple questions that sort of motivate this is then how does this tie into droughts? We can think about a drought as being a lack of access to water. There is less water around than we think there should be or than would meet our water demand. And so this means that I'm going to either have to buy additional water or I'm going to have to ask people to cut their water use. There's actions that have to be taken by a utility. And we want to understand how these actions impact high income and low income groups. Um, so to do this, there's a lot of sort of engineering background uh, where we build a lot of simulations. We build a lot of models of the way that utilities make decisions, the way that utilities try to minimize their costs and make sure that they can provide reliable access to water. But ultimately, the question is how this impacts individuals or how this impacts households. And I'll, I'll put a few sort of detailed results in here and talk about them, but I think there's a lot of important takeaways which we can talk about in a broader context. Um, and so this figure here is showing, every one of these bars is showing how rates might change through the course of a drought for different populations. So this, this whole left-hand column here is showing how water bills change for low-income households during a drought. This center column is showing how water bills might change for high-income households during a drought. And then we also want to understand how utilities are impacted by this, right? How big institutions have their finances changed by droughts, and we see that on the right. Uh, but the takeaway, the thing that I'll highlight uh, to talk more about is that in certain circumstances, we see that the way utilities are structured and the way that they make decisions, when there is a drought, water bills tend to go up more for low income households. And in a lot of cases, water bills go down for high income households. So some of the decisions that utilities can make can have this disproportionate effect in which you're increasing a financial burden for low income households. You're making water more unaffordable for those who are already facing financial hardship and you're making water cheaper. You're making water more available for high income households. And a lot of this has to do with the sort of utility finances and the way that decisions are made. Um, but there is this strong disproportionality in a lot of cases to see that some of the decisions that utilities or, or, or municipalities will make to try to promote resilience to droughts, resilience to climate change, ultimately have a bit of an unequal impact between high and low income households. Um, also, there's a lot of influence of the types of droughts, right? We see a lot of, of dependence when we run these models on what the future looks like. If we have more long droughts or we have more very intense short droughts, uh, these can really characterize or change a lot of the ways that droughts in terms of affordability are felt by high and low income households. So there, there's a lot of impacts of the climate itself and of the way that the climate is gonna impact water specifically on both high and low income individuals. Um, another component of this, so as I've been doing this work and sort of interfacing with NGOs and community groups, specifically in California, um, there's this process where we've aimed to understand what affordability means to those who are being heavily impacted by this. And one common, common thread that we hear from NGOs who, who try to help communities that are impacted by droughts is that uh, low rates is very important. Right? Having a cheap water bill is, is a really important consideration of affordability. But having a very steady water bill is also an incredibly important concern for lower income households who need to be able to plan and budget accordingly. If all of a sudden my water bills spike because my utility had to buy a bunch of extra water and, and build a bunch of new pipelines, et cetera, uh, this presents an extreme problem for low income households. And so we try to think about the way we're trying to expand this definition or this concept of affordability to understand how utilities and the decisions that engineers might make both contribute to keeping water costs low, but also keeping them very consistent. And, and all of these points being in different locations on this figure is just showing that the two of those, these two concepts are very disjointed from one another and that many engineering decisions that we can make will have a balance of either creating variability in my water bills or making them low. And this is a decision that needs to be incorporated and presented to community groups. Um, finally, I'll, I'll go back to highlighting sort of this, this disproportionality in water bills um, and, and bring up a point which I'll, I'll try to connect a little bit uh, more to, to Indiana and, and sort of the larger United States which is that in this case, the, the decisions which a utility might make, if I, if I have a range of portfolio of options of, I can build a new reservoir or desalination plant or new wells or new pipelines, the decisions which are best, if I just look at what is best for my low income households, I might make a specific decision. And in a lot of cases, that's also best for high income households. Over all of the decisions that I could make, it's gonna provide the smallest financial burden to low income households. It's gonna reduce high income households water bills the most. It's gonna be the cheapest for me if I'm a utility, but it's gonna create the most difference between high and low income households. So we see there's a direct trade-off 
between concepts of resilience and concepts of equity. So if I'm building, trying to build resilience into my system, I might be creating something which is inherently inequitable between high and low income individuals, in this case, high and low income water users or ratepayers. Um, I, I'm, the larger point that I'd like to try to make about this is that in, in California, we're very water stressed. Uh, that's certainly not the case for the entire United States. But we've seen in California an increasing pattern of droughts. Droughts have become more intense, they've become longer, and they're forecasted because of climate change to only continue in that direction, which has led to a fundamental change or a non-stationarity in, in the, the typical hydroclimatic experiences that we have. And so the, the point that I'd like to try to make at a, at a larger level is that when we think about massive changes or large-scale changes in the way that our climate is going to be impacting our community, we need to be also considering these at the interface of different socioeconomic, different racial, different ethnic groups to understand when I make these interventions, who is going to be experiencing these outcomes. Uh, the, these figures showing the balance of rain versus snow, I think, are always very interesting. And so on the left, I'm showing um, these are from the, the climate change impacts assessment that where different regions will have a balance of rain versus snow and how that will change. And on the right, just simply, this is a figure of, of household level income at a county level. Um, in the state of Indiana, and we, we want to make sure that when we're trying to address things like the issues we see on the left, or we have to understand the impacts of these, we want to be cognizant of the things on the right. We want to be cognizant of the way and the different demographic groups who are going to be impacted by this, particularly from an engineering concept where my experience has been that the, our trend is to, to think about very large scale sort of system level. I want to minimize my costs. I want to do things which are which are thinking in a very broad scale. We need to be very conscious of local level or household level, individual level impacts of climate change and who is going to be experiencing these. Um, and so you know, a lot of the things which, I, you know, again, I'd like to sort of you know, posit as, as being some of the takeaways from this is that this is a lot of this work has said we need to be very careful of how we design and manage our infrastructure and our systems in the built environment to try to build climate resilience and really be focusing on who is experiencing the benefits of these interventions, who is experiencing the benefits of these outcomes. Um, and this is, is very what well, nicely parallels, I think, a lot of the other panelists today. But the, to put a bit of a positive spin on it, um, a lot of these issues, we're, ex we're finding these issues exist and are relatively, there are, there are solutions to these issues in a lot of ways because many of them have just come up because we haven't addressed them or we haven't thought about them in the way that we've made planning models. So if I'm a, a water utility, typically I just haven't thought about the way that affordability is going to be impacting high and low income individuals. And so there are a lot of easy changes that can be made. In California, we've got a laundry list of California water policies, which with small tweaks can really start to ameliorate this disproportionality. So a lot of these issues are just because these haven't been present comments, these haven't been present ideas. Um, in the minds of the decision makers and those who are trying to solve these types of problems. And as we see that sort of uh, critical mass of that growing with, with events like today, uh, hopefully these problems can be addressed relatively quickly, right? There is a lot we have tools and methods to try to address these things. It's about pointing them in the right direction and making sure that we're ethical users of them. So I appreciate the ability to talk with you all today. Thanks so much. Great, thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Uh, all right, and so our next panelist is Anna Schultz. Okay, I'm just trying to share my screen. Oh, here we go. And, okay, can everybody see that? Looks great. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Becca and Ben, for your presentations. Um, really interesting to see this uh, climate justice being talked about in urban environments and I'm hoping to provide, you know, a different perspective in an international location with a more uh, rural community. And so today I'll be approaching the topic of climate justice through my uh, recent dissertation research, which explores the complex relationship between conservation and indigenous people through an ethnographic or mainly qualitative study of former uh, hunter gatherers called the Batwa and their interactions with conservation and related development projects on the outskirts of Bwindi and Penetral National Park in Uganda. So the Batwa identify themselves as the first people to inhabit this region, living in the dense Afromontane forests of Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. Bwindi and Penetral National Park is located in the southwestern Uganda and is the dark green you can see on the map here. I mainly worked on the edges of the park and this is indicated by the second arrow in uh, the Kanungu district. 
So over time, the Batu have experienced multiple waves of displacement from the forest, which has put an end to their hunting and gathering subsistence strategy. Historically, the Batu lost territories to agricultural migrants, and more recently in 1991, conservation policies eliminated all forest access to conserve endangered mountain gorillas and promote gorilla tourism through the creation of Bwindi and Penetral National Park. So Bwindi is located in the Albertine Rift, which is a region of global significance due to its high biodiversity and many endangered species like the gorilla. At the time this park was created, gorillas were classified as critically endangered and were vulnerable to several threats such as intense deforestation, climate change, and poaching. However, recent conservation efforts have increased the gorilla's population from a few hundred to just over a thousand individuals, so allowing them to be downlisted on the IUCN red list to endangered. So the preservation of windy forests has also helped to stimulate, stimulate the local economy through gorilla tourism and provides uh, drinking water to local residents. While the conservation of windy forests was successful, it came at a high price to the Batwa community. Most of the Batwa living in the forest were relocated to settlements, but many remained landless, squatting on the dominant ethnic group's land or moving frequently from place to place to find shelter. There was no freer prior informed consent process and the Batwa were not consulted or asked to help co-manage the national park or their ancestral lands. So the Batwa were expected to assimilate into the dominant culture and become agriculturalists. As a result of their displacement, uh, the Batwa struggle with cultural degradation, uh, reliable livelihood strategies, threats from climate change, and social marginalization by other ethnic groups who view them as more primitive because of their history and their connection to the forest. So many of the Batwa were resettled to unfertile and undesirable plots of land some on dangerous mountainsides, like the one in this picture, making them especially vulnerable to the threats of climate change. According to the 2020 UN Environmental uh, Program Report uh, for this region, the global temperature has risen by an average of 0.7 degrees Celsius since 1980, with mountain regions experiencing even higher temperature increases. This has caused changes to rainfall patterns, extreme weather events, and temperatures that make farming livelihoods unpredictable. The Batwa are among the most vulnerable and food insecure in this region. So the lack of attention to justice in the conservation planning and subsequent development projects have left the Batwa in a precarious socioeconomic position. Due to structural and systemic injustices, the Batwa lack the adaptive capacities to respond to disruptions from climate change such as high rates of food insecurity and poor health outcomes. Conservation and development interventions implemented at Bwindi have been historically top down, funded by international governments and international NGOs with projects focused on finding alternative livelihoods that decrease local communities' dependency on the forest. The decisions made under the guidance of Western conservation principles or at global meetings can negatively impact the daily lives of local people. Over time, significant structural barriers are erected that constrain Indigenous livelihoods, their health, cultural identity, and well-being. When trying to resolve or ameliorate the impacts of climate change, it's important to not only consider wildlife and conservation goals, but to also be mindful of how conservation policies will impact Indigenous peoples and local communities. Unfortunately, the Batwa are not alone in their experience with conservation. Many other indigenous peoples and local communities from all over the world are dispossessed of traditional land and natural resources. Given their experiences, local representatives of marginalized and indigenous communities bring their local concerns of conservation, environmental degradation, and climate change to global spaces. And they work to recenter the local voice to bring global attention to the ways they continue to be displaced by global and local efforts to conserve or manage their environments. In addition to my research with the Batwa, I'm a member of the Presence to Influence research team founded by Laura Zanotti from Purdue Anthropology Department and Kimberly Marion Suosia in the Political Department at Northwestern, Political Science Department. As a team, we investigated the ways indigenous peoples influence global environmental governance using collaborative event ethnography. So in 2016, we attended the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's World Conservation Congress in Hawaii. The World Conservation Congress is a large meeting held every four years and brings together several thousand leaders and decision makers from governments, civil society, indigenous peoples, 
business and academia with the goal to address environmental challenges and conservation issues. So um, you can also visit our website if you'd like to learn more about our research. Um, I put it at the bottom of this slide um, and also our research methods. So I was interested in understanding how powerful global actors can determine local realities and control access to participation in environmental governance and impact climate justice for indigenous people. Overall, our team attended over 104 events. I analyzed 55 of these events collected by our team, and I selected events where indigenous people participated and gave speeches, but also included events where non-indigenous participants spoke about indigenous peoples and the role they should play in environmental governance. When I discuss global environmental governance in this context, I'm talking about the different organizations, the policies and rules, financing mechanisms and procedures and norms that regulate the process of global environmental protection. So I identified two categories um, of actors with competing discourses at the World Conservation Congress regarding indigenous peoples and their role in global environmental governance. So actors from category one, which included indigenous people and their allies, emphasized their concern over continued human rights abuses and conservation calling for attention to justice, while actors from category two, which included IUCN members, representatives, uh, states and governments, and international NGOs, they focused their speeches on how to integrate indigenous knowledge into the sustainable development goals, rather than addressing indigenous people's concerns. So the sustainable development goals um, are a set of 17 goals that are adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015. So the goal is set environmental policy for the next 15 years and recognize how climate change can impact how we manage our natural resources, which can in turn threaten our ability to reduce inequalities and eradicate poverty. However, actors from category one express concern with the integration of indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge into mainstream conservation. Category two actors continue to dismiss indigenous concerns in favor of discussions that were centered on climate change or the sustainable development goals. This demonstrates a lack of commitment to indigenous identified issues and a failure to acknowledge or address past injustices. My early experiences at the World Conservation Congress provided me with valuable insights to understanding the role of indigenous peoples um, and the roles they have played in global environmental governance and allowed me to be attentive to how global environmental policy may impact the Batwa in their local context. During fieldwork, I interviewed several Batwa who had traveled to international meetings with the goal to share the Batwa situation at Bwindi with others and look for outside supports. One individual had saved their delegate badge from the World Parks Congress, proud of their travels and efforts to seek justice for their communities. In addition, I interviewed one younger Batwa woman who is pictured here. Um, she traveled to the United Nations uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in New York City in 2015. While the Batwa were able to express their own agency through their political activism, the absence of structural supports often means there's little opportunity for information sharing or funds available for future travels that are needed to sustain such efforts. While climate change is at the forefront of indigenous people's concerns, they remain cautious in respect to conventional climate change solutions and the idea of co-producing knowledge with Western science. Since conservation and development actors are often focused on achieving broader environmental goals set by the global community, they may bypass indigenous concerns and fail to create authentic pathways for their participation. Engaging local communities, but especially indigenous communities like the Batwa and systems of environmental governance might lead to more just outcomes and sustain community engagement and conservation. Thank you. That's the end. Great, thanks Savannah. All right, uh, so I think we can, uh, Jeff, we we're gonna throw it open to the floor, is that right? Okay, all right. If you have a question, I would uh, really encourage you to turn on your camera and unmute and ask it with your real human voice. Um, if that's not a possibility, you can put them in the chat and I'll try and monitor that and, and insert those into the conversation as we go. Um, does anyone have a question that wants to lead us off? 
Yes, I do. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is uh, Tom Brown from the School of Management, and I appreciate having the opportunity to uh, uh, listen in on your, your panel. I have a question for the second panelist um, about her work along the uh, Eastern Coast and the Lake, the Great Lakes. I was wondering if, if county and state parks or even national parks along the coastlines um, have been included in her studies and and if those uh, provide any kind of equity for all, all peoples to uh, benefit from, from the coastal areas. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, that's a great question. So these were focused on areas of concern and some of them do touch um, national parks or more specifically in the Grand Cal area um, with the newly designated national shoreline there on Lake Michigan. Um, but that hasn't emerged yet in any of our data um, as an important implication for access, though I imagine that it will as we continue to talk to residents, um, because most of our work is along these um, inlet water bodies, right, the river or Muskegon or White Lake, etc. We don't ask specifically about um, the lake shore, but it has come up a couple times in people wanting to go to maybe the cleaner lakeshore rather than an inlet lake. Um, so I think there is possibility that it could increase access, but sometimes those are farther away from the areas that we are looking at. So transportation can be an issue. There's been talk about if they're ADA compliant for um, people with disabilities, if they can get into the areas. Um, so I think there's potential, but I think more conversation has to be happening about how we can get people there if they want to go to the lake, um, and making sure that they're accessible for all the residents interested in using it. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. I appreciate that. Um, you, is that true also for the, along the Eastern coast of the country from Florida up to uh, Connecticut? That I'm not sure of in terms of, we didn't include any data on location of national parks or shoreline there. That could be an interesting addition to think about if that changes risk or um, vulnerability, but we didn't include that data there. Thank you. Other questions? There is a question in the chat. Oh, there is. Okay. Uh -huh. So Marshall asked, what might be some examples of water systems and designs in California that are more equitable to low income people? Hmm. I think that's for me. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Marshall. Um, so as I mentioned, we sort of have a lot of evidence to say that there's a dependence on what particular types of on the, the hydroclimate conditions really, really change a lot of these outcomes. Um, and what we're seeing is that the, the more information that we have about the, the particular type of drought that we're, we're seeing, and the more that we can tailor our, it's, it is the relationship of the infrastructure that I'm building to the particular type of drought that I have, that's really critical. Um, so in most cases, overbuilding infrastructure. So in, in California, we think about desalination plants a lot. Building a big desalination plant tends to have really poor outcomes for low income individuals because it, it increases water rates so significantly. Um, similarly, a lot of very short term mitigation efforts. So this is when the governor comes and says, everybody cut your water use by 20% or, or, or sort of short term fixes. These also don't have great outcomes. And it is that if I have a long drought and I have some idea that there's a long drought coming and I'm able to build, uh, use sort of medium scale infrastructure. So this might be building a, or buying into a local groundwater bank or building water recycling programs. Things which provide a medium amount of capacity for this sort of medium term drought, the closer we can align the two of those, the better the outcomes are for, for low income individuals specifically. By and large, high income individuals do pretty well and the concern isn't really there regardless of what we do. But thinking about the, those who are, who are more water or financially stressed, it's making sure we can align the two of those. That's the, that's the biggest contributor when it comes to building infrastructure. Great catch, great question. Ben, can you say anything about uh, the role of communities in providing input and feedback to the utilities as they're making these decisions? That's been a really interesting question. So we're, we're doing a lot of this work in consultation with and in partnership with different utilities in California. Um, 
and they have a lot of different questions or different opinions on on the role of affordability. Uh, quite a few who will remain unnamed have said something like, "Yeah, our water is really affordable." We look at our rates and we see that they're, we don't think they're too bad if we compare them to the rest of California. Um, or a lot will say something like, "We have a low income rate assistance program, and we think that's really great." But also, we find that about fifteen percent of our population really has a hard time paying their bills on time, and so. So a lot of it has just been engaging. Um, the, the dominant paradigm so far, specifically in California, has been that if I'm a utility, if I can keep my costs low, that gets directly passed on to affordability for customers. And what we're seeing is that those are very mismatched. So the, the process of engaging community groups has been ongoing and very difficult. It's been made, uh, this process has been accelerated by some of the more recent, more severe droughts. Um, there's, there's been instances where particular communities have been entirely cut off from other water supplies. And so the, the state has to intervene and will literally bring trucks of water or school buses full of bottled water into communities. Um, so this has really started to shed, shed a lot of light on the concerns. Um, but it has been an ongoing process. And, and the, the typical, what we have experienced is the sort of typical way of thinking is that if I'm a utility, so long as my, my costs are low, that's, that's a plus. And that we're finding that there's a lot of instances where that doesn't necessarily hold. Thank you. Uh, Jeff reminded me that it is one o'clock. And so uh, if folks need to leave, uh, no worries. But I think several of us are willing to stick around and continue the discussion for a bit longer. Uh, so if you have questions or if you're interested in hearing the question answers, please stick around and we'll keep going. On that note, does anyone else have a question for one of our panelists? Uh, Marshall had another question. Uh, what might be examples of climate change projects and conservation efforts in Africa that are more sensitive to indigenous concerns? I think that one's for me. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that one important thing that when people are trying to think of how they can help communities in rural areas um, adjust or adapt to climate change is to first consult them. Um, that has been historically not done with the Batwa community, surprisingly. Um, surprisingly, people come with their own ideas and their own um, projects that they think will work for the community, but um, those projects are often very short lived and they don't end up working for the day to day lives of those people because they never really ask them, how should we go about helping you or what is it that you may need or how do you envision um, You know what kinds of things are in what ways do you envision contributing to um, a project or plans and so they often often um, international NGOs use like intermediary um, people. So maybe someone from another ethnic group. There's many different kinds of people living in these areas. And so um, that's something that, that uh, people don't often think about as well is that there's not just one group of people living here, but maybe two or three. And there might be different kinds of relationships between those groups. And so in Bwindi, there's a more dominant ethnic group that lives there who has had more opportunities for education and can um, benefit more from pro these types of projects and will often act as an intermediary between um, the NGO and the Batwa community, which can end up um, not having great outcomes for the Batwa because they might circumvent the funds for their own projects or um, design things in a way that isn't going to work for them. So, yeah. Savannah, have you seen examples of uh, instances where this has been done well, where indigenous people are, their right to self has been respected and they've been consulted when conservation decisions are made? Is there, is there, examples we should be looking to of how to do this well? There definitely are um, examples in different parts of the world, like from my own um, observations with the in this part, uh, in this region, there, there's very few, um, just because of the ways that the that conservation has been brought into 
Africa and most of, you know, Asia as well is more this top down approach. But, you know, recently people are recognizing that. And I would say um, in South America, in the Amazon, in in like Kayapo communities and community indigenous communities there where they've been able to maintain more of their own land and land territories and have more sovereignty that they have the ability to um, make more of those decisions for themselves and they have more um because they have more territory they have like more clout and more ability to assert themselves especially in global meetings and things but smaller groups who have like the batwa who have become landless and um have uh, experienced many decades of discrimination and social marginalization have fewer I've, I've noticed fewer opportunities to do so so there, and, and it's becoming it's becoming um, more of a topic like de decolonizing conservation and um, is becoming part of like conversations at the World Conservation Congress now that weren't there even just five years ago. So that's hopeful. I have maybe a parallel question that I'd like to put to Brady and Rebecca, maybe that that has to do with um, some of the um, some of the differences that we see in in temperature, for instance, that you showed Brady within cities and how neighborhoods that are redlined are much hotter and have fewer fewer trees, less green, essentially, um, to cool them down than um, than the now richer uh, neighborhoods that were not redlined. Um, there are certainly lots of campaigns to plant trees. Some of those are horrifically unsuccessful and some of them are more successful. And I, I wonder if you have any thinking on sort of what are the, you know, not that tree planting is necessarily the only way, but what are the, what are the best ways, um, what are the success stories maybe if you can point us to any of um, trying to alleviate that disparity, which is, which is only going to get worse and more dangerous with more extreme uh, hot temperatures in the, in the summers in the Midwest and, um, in you know most of the U.S. Yeah, so I will say that I think most of the big cities in the U.S. are aware of this, and the cities that have resources are generally trying to plant trees. Um, those that have the, their wits about them are trying to do that in a way that helps rectify some of these legacies uh, of redlining. Um, so New York had a plant a million trees initiative that they actually wrapped up a couple of years ago. Um, they planted their millionth tree, um, and in and you'll I'm a tree guy, so you'll never hear me say that planting trees is a bad idea. Um, but there are other ways. Um, it's it's one tool in the toolbox, right? Um, and so neighborhoods that have low or no canopy cover should definitely receive the benefits of planting trees. But the trees that are feasible to plant are too small to provide much in the way of cooling benefits for at least a decade. Uh, often several decades are required for the tree to get big enough. Mortality rates of trees in cities are uh, very high. Um, and so it's we usually throw around numbers like 50% mortality within the first five to 10 years. Um, and there are some cities where that's just factored in. They figure every five years they'll go plant a tree in that spot. And that tree never gets big enough to provide any benefits. Meanwhile, we're uh, incurring all the costs of the money and also the uh, impact uh, and emissions of the planting effort. Um, and so I would say that in addition to planting trees, we need to be investing as much, if not more, in maintaining the trees that are around um, that are providing those services. And that's something that is uh, undervalued uh, and underappreciated. So Lindsay Purcell, our uh, urban forest uh, extension agent in FNR, will say he often makes the case that he could go to any city or around campus any day of the week and pass the hat and ask for money to plant trees and everyone will chip in a buck and he'll be able to get money to go plant trees. But if he were to pass the hat and ask for money to maintain trees, nobody's willing to pony up for that uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so 
and we see that on our own campus where you know big old trees are cut down to make way for construction and then they plant the same number of trees or even double the number of trees that are tiny and they say oh the number of trees on campus has stayed the same or increased meanwhile the net benefits provided by those trees is dramatically reduced um, and so we really need to be thinking about maintenance of our trees they really are infrastructure that we grow um, and if we are not growing it appropriately, we are losing it. Um, there's studies from a variety of cities showing that planting efforts and also maintenance efforts at keeping these trees alive are not on track to, so cities are on track to lose canopy over the next hundred years, given current rates of mortality and planting. Um, and so if we want our cities to have a certain canopy cover in the future, 100 years from now, we need to be thinking about what we need to do now to make that happen. Because big old trees in cities don't happen by accident. Becca, did you, Jeff sort of pitched that to both of us. Did you have anything that you wanted to? No, that's super interesting. I didn't know about that 50%. <laughs> that's alarming to think about. The only thing I would add is also, maybe even echoing what Savannah mentioned too, of working with individuals and households on the ground. So if tree canopy isn't going to solve the problem right now, how can we improve quality of life um, right now too and help people adapt to increasing temperatures, making sure access to utilities, water, energy, et cetera, are equitable across households, I think is also important. Marshall asked a question about the potential for rooftop and backyard gardening programs in these low income, hotter urban areas. I think those, I don't know for canopy considerations, but I know those are also varying in success um, because they require a lot of investment, right, of local communities. And I think they can be done well um, from more maybe bottom up strategies, um, but can be difficult to maintain, maybe similar to the tree canopy. I don't know if you have anyone else has comments on that, but um, yeah, that's what I would add. I'll jump in quickly on Marshall's question. I would say that uh, that's certainly part of a multifaceted solution. Obviously, uh, lettuce doesn't cast a lot of shade for people to get under, um, but plants do act essentially as swamp coolers. Um, and so the more vegetation we can cram into cities, the more cooling benefits we'll have from it, even if you're not standing under the shade of your uh, tomato plant. Um, so I think that's uh, a possibility. One of the, I think, real potentials of, use, of treating vegetation in cities as infrastructure that we grow is that very often it will uh, ameliorate several problems at once, right? And so something like rooftop and backyard gardens are going to be addressing food security issues um, while providing pollinator habitat and and um, you know, some wind benefits and things like that, uh, as well as you know, potentially mitigating stormwater. So, so there are ways to address multiple problems simultaneously. Other questions from the audience? Becca, I jotted down a question for you which was uh, whether or not you have in your study of these things run across any particular policies that seem effective at addressing the intersection of climate and gentrification. I've seen more about gentrification, but I, I haven't um, encountered much about the intersection of the two. Sure, yeah, it's, I mean, at this point, it's more an emerging topic, right? So I think we're still exploring what policies are going to be effective and it's one of the problems is that it's also in even our work and in increasing trying to understand what is just normal gentrification, right? What is climate driven gentrification and how much does it matter, but potentially how do we better understand the drivers so that we can target interventions, right? But that is definitely a question when we're thinking about policy is what is driving these changes. And in terms of climate gentrification specifically, some policies I think like affordable housing, transit, um, mixed use um, or mixed income housing where you have some housing units downtown that are subsidized right can be really effective whether it's driven by climate or other factors in terms of gentrification and then um, in terms of climate specific I think there's been some studies and exploration of thinking about um, infrastructure development in terms of um, 
the East Coast, especially looking at um, where the infrastructure that will protect our coasts from climate is appearing and who's developing it and how can we make sure that's equitably dispersed across different communities. Um, and the second or the third thing I would say is part of this gentrification aspect or displacement around climate is climate migration or climate retreat moving people um, from high risk areas. So that's a question that is continuously being asked in this study. I don't have any answers about that. It's a really complicated process and lots of implications there, but that's another question of one is it equitable to move people away from high risk areas. Um, and that what changes is that going to impact in places that receive people from these um, high risk areas? That's not really any answers, but those are some of the other things that people are talking about in terms of solutions. I have a question for uh, Ben, actually, if um, if it's okay to to ask this. Um, one of the things you talked about, Ben, was how if you don't get the right size intervention, um, it's going to be bad for the lower income communities because the burden of cost is essentially going up on them. But it seems like another tool that you have to um, that you being a utility or a, whoever sets the rates, I guess, another tool would be to change the pricing a bit. I mean, I, I think in many places, there's something like a tier one and tier two price where your first tier is for the, you know, a small allotment that everybody essentially gets at a lower price. And then, and then if you use more than that, the, the price goes way up. And it, it seems like by changing the threshold for those tiers or changing the prices of those tiers, you could offset some of those issues. So I'm curious to what extent you might be looking at that, to what extent that gets played with, and that could sort of solve some of these issues. Well, Jeff, you're not supposed to say when you're the reviewer of someone's paper, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it is a, a super prescient question. And this is something that I, in the last few years have become kind of new to the California water world. Um, but it, so it turns out that in most places, there are there is a, a cottage industry of what are called rate consultants. And they come in and they, they say, uh, this is the demographic profile. This is how much financial burden we think your, your households can bear. This is how much water we think they use. We're going to figure out what those tier widths and those bins are. So that's, that's one hand. There are people who are doing that to try to, to maximize revenues for utilities. Um, on the other side, in California specifically, there's a lot of regulations on the books about how you can set these bins. Um, there's a thing called Proposition 218, which is this very interesting legacy of, of how it came about. But it essentially says that every one of those, those little tiers, right? If I'm charging incrementally increasing costs of service, that has to be, if I'm a utility, that has to be directly and verifiably tied to some co extra cost that I'm incurring. And this is a really interesting or difficult problem for utilities because typically if I'm a water producer, I'm spending millions, could be hundreds of millions of dollars to produce the first gallon of water and incrementally, I'm spending very little to produce. The marginal cost of water is very small. The upfront cost of developing water supplies is high. And as you so utility has this very strong diminishing cost of providing services, but it makes a lot of sense. And it's very, uh, it, it is very beneficial. We see this testing some different rate structures. It's very beneficial for low income households to have a progressive rate structure, but a utility has a regressive structure of costs and those two have to more or less be aligned. Um, so this is a, a policy recommendation that we have is that there's ways to adjust California water policy to allow utilities to create these progressive rate structures. Uh, the, the end result of that in a lot of places, and then we see this more in affluent communities in Southern California, but they do what are called budget-based rates. So the, the water utility will drive around to everybody's home and they'll take some measurements of the square footage of your yard and they'll know how many people you have. They'll look at an estimate of your appliances. Maybe you have the fancy low flow toilets or a, a tiny shower head. They, they do this big calculation and they say, how much water should you be using every month for every month of the year? And they adjust it that way. And then you basically pay wholesale costs for the water that you're budgeted to use and you pay out the tooth for anything above that. And so they're, they're very specific. They do this house by house. Um, they, again, the California water policy says that that's probably not okay to do um, because that's not exactly tying it to the cost it provides the service for. Um, so there's a lot of contestants, a lot of lawyers who are involved in trying to figure out how, how we can structure these rates. 
Uh, but it is a really beneficial tool for trying to adjust uh, water pricing and adjust water use. But I'll, I'll put a big caveat on all of this, which is that for low income users, typically um, survey based or sort of ethnographic studies have found that most low income water users have already gone through the process of, of cutting use. They've already gone through the process of of getting rid of extra water use. They've, they've gone through, they don't wash their cars. They don't, they're, they're really trying to cut back because it is a larger proportion of their discretionary or disposable income. They've really done a good job of paring that down to begin with. And there's not a lot of margin to reduce it any further. So they are any rate change that we experience or propose. We have to be really careful of the impacts it's gonna have on a low income household because basically they're gonna be using the same amount of water regardless. Where a high income household if I increase my water rates exponentially or, or very much for high income users, they will reduce their water use, right? There is an elasticity. They will change their behavior, but that's not homogenous across populations. Interesting sort of conundrum to solve. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's fascinating. And I'm not reviewing your paper. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't accusing you of it, but yeah, it's certainly something we're working on. That's just what you'd expect a reviewer to say. Do we have other questions? Last call. Okay, well, hearing none, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, thank all of our panelists very much. Uh, extra thanks to Becca for stepping in at the last minute, literally, to fill in for one of our panelists. Uh, who had to step away. And so um, thanks again to Jeff for organizing and for all of you for being here and for the great discussion. Thank you everybody for, to, for attending today and for our, to our panelists and to Jeff for putting all this together. And it was a really excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Thanks all and thanks organizers, appreciate it.